same conferences, but mostly not. Um, and it, it seems to me, it is puzzling to me, um, especially why I don't see more Holocaust scholars and anti-Semitism conferences, since anti-Semitism has something to do with the Holocaust. Uh, the Holocaust is where uh, you, you see anti-Semitism in its uh, most radical manifestation. If you want to know what it is, that's, that's where one should look. Um, and as, as we move in from uh, National Socialist anti-Semitism into contemporary manifestations, I mean, it behooves us to ask where, what is the connection, is there a connection, and what might the connection be? Um, I also like to ask, what is, what is, what is an anti-Semite anti, anyway? Um, why the Jews? Who are the Jews? I started studying the Holocaust in 1978 when I read Night by Elie Wiesel. And uh, before I got through the first page, I realized I need to do a whole bunch of studying just to start to approach this. He mentions Hasidism, Shekhinah, destruction of the temple, Maimonides, I'm like, who's that, what's that, what's that, what's that? Um, one uh, point of connection that you find between Hitler and Hamas is that they both invoke the protocols of the elders of Zion as if it were scripture. Um, the protocols, uh, as you may know, uh, initially circled in Ru circulated in Russia between 1897 and 1898, uh, was published uh, a few years later, 1903-04. Uh, 
um, based on a couple of uh, works of fiction written in the 1860s by Hermann Goethe Gert and Maurice Jolie. Um, the the you know the hidden world Jewish conspiracy thinking though is traceable at least as far back as the 12th century with the Theobald of Cambridge who claimed that the Jew Jewish elders would meet once a year secretly to discuss uh, which Christian children they're going to slaughter for the coming over the coming years. So I mean you have this secret plotting ominous evil hidden present. You can't see it, but it's there. Um, the charter, the Hamas <coughs> charter, invokes three texts as foundations for, for the truth that they, take, that they take themselves to espouse. The Quran, the Hadith, and the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So, um, what is it? What is anti-Semitism? What do we learn about what anti-Semitism is when we look at the Holocaust, which is where I'm going to start? Um, Emmanuel Levinas, uh, who in, in my view was the most important Jewish thinker in the 20th century, certainly post-Holocaust, um, he says, he describes anti-Semitism, among other words, as hatred of the other man, as he puts it, hatred of the other human being. Of course, uh, those of you who are familiar with Levinas, you know that uh, for Levinas, the, the, the higher relation is couched in the human relation. There's no relation to God without the human-to-human -human relation. So hatred of the other person is a hatred of the one who commands us to love the other person. Jew hatred is God hatred. The anti-Semite is trying to get rid of God. It's trying, and what do you get rid of when you get rid of God? You get rid of the one who is putting to, to me the question put to the first murderer, where's your brother and what have you done? The question put to the first human, where are you? You get rid of the one who is holding me, I get rid of the one who is holding me to uh, an, an infinite responsibility for the other human being who is infinitely dear. And it's, of course it's a responsibility I can never meet, I can never measure up to. Um, in 1922, according to Hermann Rauschen, Hitler said to Rauschen, my aim is to destroy the tyrannical God of the Jews and his life-denying Ten Commandments. What do you eliminate when you eliminate God? It's not only this, this infinite responsibility, but you eliminate the prohibition against murder. Um, the sages tell us that when we read the Ten Commandments, we should read them, read them not one through ten, or from top to bottom, but from right to left, or, or left to right. I am God means don't murder. When you eliminate the, the dimension of height, you eliminate the absolute prohibition. Do not murder. You think about this. The Nazis systematically get rid of that prohibition systematically legalized murder, so to speak. Um, killing gets glorified. And, and, and you can think of many examples of that. So, um, there's the elimination of the prohibition. Therefore, the Nazis were not anti-Semites because they were racist. They were racist because they were anti-Semites. They have to establish anti-Semitism as a first principle in order to arrive at a racist outlook. Anti-Semitism is not racism. It's not a subset of racism. It's not about color. It's not about ethnic hostility. Jews come from all sorts of ethnic backgrounds. 
cultures, languages, dress, attitudes, in all colors. Um, it's not about scapegoating. It's not about xenophobia. It's not about economic envy. It's not about the Treaty of Versailles. It's, it's, it has a metaphysical dimension from which these, these can be manifestations of. It can manifest as scapegoating. It's not reducible to that. Um, so, in the metaphysics of anti-Semitism, it's not just that everything Jewish is evil, but everything evil is Jewish. So you have, in, in the discourse of the, of the anti-Semites, Nazi or Jihadists, this Manichaean, good versus evil, light versus darkness, uh, you know, what, what Joel Carmichael calls the Satanizing of the Jew. Um, so the Jewish soul, the Jewish essence, has to be eliminated. The Nazis are not undertaking a program of ethnic cleansing. They're not getting rid of political enemies. Uh, they're not getting rid of, uh, it's, it's not an internecine war that they're fighting. It's, a, it's an apocalyptic battle, it's as they see it. Um, so they have, to, I mean, they systematically undertake an assault on the soul before killing the body. Um, they dehumanize, brutalize, humiliate before they murder. It's not enough just to kill. Um, how do you kill the soul? You kill the human relationship. The soul draws its breath in the between space of human relationship. One of the most chilling lines in all of Holocaust literature is in night when Eliezer's trying to find something to eat for his father in Buchenwald. One of the prisoners says to him, here there are no fathers. There are no sons. There are no brothers. Think about it. This is a realm, an anti-war, in which there are, there is no human relationship. Primo Levi says everyone, this is, this is a Levi combination of word, uh, words, and, and Auschwitz, everyone was ferociously alone. Ferociously alone. Everyone around you, says Levi, was either an enemy or a rival. Um, the Nazis, of course, were experts on Jewish tradition. Judaism. They used the Hebrew calendar to plan their actions against the Jews. Um, they, at various points along the way, they would prohibit this, that, and the other, prohibit Sabbath observance, prohibit having a, a, a mezuzah on your door, prohibit use of the ritual bath. Um, the second law, the second anti-Jewish law passed in 1933, April 21st, 1933, was the prohibition against ritual slaughter. Kashru. Methods of slaughter that make uh, food kosher. Um, the Nazis systematically target children and elders. Targeted children and elders. Now, who are you know, very important groups in, in, in any human tradition. Do you recall at night when Eliezer arrives at the camp, they ask him, the, 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 the prisoners unloading the cars and stuff, how old are you? 15. No, no, you're 18. How old is your father? 50. No, he's 40. If they think you're a kid or they think he's older, they'll kill you. Um, Elie Eli Wiesel said it was as if the Nazis knew what children mean in our tradition. It's not as if, however. Uh, but Thomas says that the world is sustained by the breath of little children. Not by the power of Atlas who holds the world on his shoulders. 
but by the breath of a child. Sustained by holiness, <coughs> not by power. Um, the Midrash says that when, when, uh, when the, the Babylonians took the Levites and the priests out of Jerusalem, it was still the holy city, but when they took the children, the city was no longer holy. The divine presence left. Systematic assault on the mothers and daughters of Israel. Motherhood became a capital crime. If the, if the crime of the Jew is being there, existing, the most heinous of criminals is the one who brings that child into the world. Here too. Um, if you know, and the Nazis know this, they're, 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 they're specialists assigned to know these things. Um, <coughs> Judaism teaches that the blessing comes to a home only through a woman. It's through a woman that the divine presence enters the home. Uh, we're taught that uh, in, uh, in the scriptures, in chapter 19 of Exodus, when it says the, the house of Jacob and children of Israel were gathered at Sinai, house of Jacob is, refers to the women, children of Israel refers to the men. Why are the women mentioned first? The rabbis say, because it's only through a woman that the men can ever hope to have access to the Torah. Uh, the elders, of course, represent the memory of the people. Eli Wiesel, Primo Levi, independently described uh, the, uh, the Holocaust as a war against memory. The war against memory is a war against relationship, against meaning, against tradition, teaching, testimony, against future. So uh, this is how you know, you, they, the Nazis undertake a systematic assault on the soul. Now, so what is the Holocaust? What do we call it? There's um, Omar Bartov uh, has said it's common that the, the multiple names of the Holocaust are, are reminiscent of the multiple names of God. It's like trying to name what can't be named. On August 26, 1941, Churchill referred to it as but saying we are in the presence of a crime without a name. This is what's happening in August 1941. The Einsatz group would have gone into action. The killing units. The four killing units fought <coughs> the German army to the east, killing every Jew they could find. Uh, reports of that by August, they, they started June 22nd. By August, reports are already coming out. People knew, the governments knew what was taking place. Churchill. We're in the presence of a crime without a name. Das was This is uh, Paul Ceylon. If Paul Ceylon, one of the most articulate and eloquent of the poets to emerge from the event, doesn't know what to call it, then you know you got it. There is a problem. So that that which happened is how Ceylon. Uh, it's referred to as the, uh, the Judenvernichtung, the annihilation of the Jews. The six Vernichtungslager, the six annihilation camps in Poland, there were about 40,000 camps of, of various kinds. Six annihilation camps were to annihilate the Juden, the, Juden, the Jews. It was the Jews who were taken from the train to the gas chambers upon arrival. So it's uh, the Shoah, and we've all heard this term, which means um, annihilation. Churban, uh, Churban, interesting word. Uh, it's a Hebrew word that's used in Yiddish to refer to the, the Holocaust. Um, there are some who refer to the Holocaust as the third Churban. What is Churban in, uh, in the religious tradition? It's the destruction of the, of the two temples. It's the destruction of the divine presence, of the divine light that emanates from the temple into the world. And we're told that the windows of the temple were designed not to let light in, but to let light out. <coughs> so um, I mean, this is term korban situates it in a, in a sacred history. Um, and it's, you know, it's the final solution to what? To the Jewish 
question. Not everything horrible that happened from 1933 to 1945 was Holocaust. Um, and lots of horrible things happened, many horrible things. Um, now, when, when we examine ways of thinking, ideology, religious traditions, philosophical viewpoints, uh, one fundamental question is, what is the view of the human being here, or the other human being? What is a human being? What, what constitutes the substance, value, dearness of a human being, or a, of the other human being? Um, these are four figures, very different, and where they're coming from and what they think, but uh, all of whom were frequently invoked by the Nazis. And the Nazis could quote Luther without editing. Uh, Luther's recommendation that camps be set up, labor camps. Luther's claim that uh, the Jews should be forbidden to study Torah on pain of death. Right. In this, this book uh, on the Jews and their lives, it's a long essay. It's not a book. Uh, Immanuel Kant. What, how could he be associated with him? Uh, the first German philosopher, if you can use the word, to join the Nazi party was in 1922. His name is Bruno Bauf. He was the editor of Kant Studien. He was a Kant. In 1939, Walter Schulze, a German professor, opened their, the annual meeting of the German professors saying what the great German idealist had dreamt of has become reality in Germany. I mean, it's something to celebrate. It's 1939, it's after Kristallnacht, uh, after you know, rounding up Jews, after way after the book or book burnings were in May 1933, mostly on university campuses. Um, this Immanuel Kant. Famously, as uh, you know, remarked in his book, uh, the, 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 the conflict of the faculties, that uh, the, the, the euthanasia of Judaism is the only right morality. It's a, it's a moral obligation to get rid of Judaism. Uh, of course, Wagner, famous anti-Semite, as Hitler once said, you can't understand national sin uh, socialism, national sympathy. National Socialism without Dr. Wagner. I mean, Wagner is essential. Wagner, uh, of course, appealing to the, the, the geist of the folk, the uh, taking the, you know, the soul on these mythological flights and to the Imperian realms and uh, through his music. Um, Nietzsche. And the will to power. The accent on the will. Um, Martin Heidegger, perhaps the most influential philosopher, suggested Levinas was the most important Jewish thinker, but Levinas is responding to Heidegger, largely. Heidegger was a, an unrepentant, card-carrying Nazi, uh, whose national socialism was perfectly consistent with his philosophy. I remember when I was in graduate school, uh, like everyone else, I pretended to understand Heidegger and, uh, and uh, was professed my love for Heidegger, but I was shocked to discover Heidegger's a Nazi. How could this be? How could it be? And I started thinking, there's nothing in his philosophy that would be inconsistent with being a Nazi. Um, he said, he said we heavily influenced by Nietzsche, and he says that the, 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 the whatever substance or existence that Dasein has, that the, the living individual has, is rooted in a will to power. The most famous Nazi propaganda film is Triumph of the Will. Not the truth, the good, justice, none of the spirit. What? Triumph of the Will. Why? Because everything else is determined by the will. 
In Nazi Germany, there was, for example, there was no concept of an unjust law. What is lawful is determined by your will. Uh, there's no, there's, there's nothing that transcends the will. There's no eternal law, divine law, natural law that the human law is trying to articulate and by which human law can be judged. Um, those of you who are familiar with the protocols of the Banzai Conference, uh, the, the meeting that Heydrich convened on January 20th, 1942, to discuss matters of principle, as he said at the outset, uh, he, if you, if you read the protocols, uh, which are you know, written up by Adolf Eichmann, um, Heidegger, uh, Heidrich mentioned a couple of times that everything, i.e. in the extermination of the Jews, has to be done in a legal manner. He was insistent on this. Uh, Himmler, October 1943, the Posen speech. Addressing, this is, you can hear it on YouTube, it was recorded. Addressing uh, members of the killing units. <coughs> uh, extolling them for, for being able to, to stand alongside 10, 100, 1,000 bodies and remain decent men. The glorious part of our history. This yeah, yeah, yeah. But he goes on, if you, if you listen, if you can stand it, if you listen further, he says, but there must be no pilfering. Anyone who takes so much as a cigarette will be shot. We're not thieves. So, um, what is the view of, of the human that's justified by will, uh, autonomy, resolve, um, Kant understands freedom in terms of autonomy and, and explains that autonomy lies in being self-legislating. In the light of reason, not from your own whim. But it's self-legislating. The perceiving self is the ground of truth, morality, reality. Um, and when, by the time you get to Nietzsche, this is the result. So what, what do you have in these, the four thinkers I brought up? You have this turn to the self, to the ego, as the center. From Luther's uh, sola fide, by faith alone, which is in me, to the Nietzsche's will to power, to Heidegger's uh, authenticity, the idea that my authenticity is rooted in my resolve in the face of death, of being toward death. Um, not in the human-to-human -human relationship. In fact, one of the things that, that Kant, uh, one of the reasons why Kant had contempt for the Jews is that they, uh, they live by commandments that come from outside of them. They're not self-legislating. They are inauthentic. They pose a danger. Um, This is a scary image to me. The, this, you know, the, 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 the sculpture called Modern Man, uh, carving out himself with a hammer. I mean, Nietzsche's uh, philosophizing with a hammer comes to mind. Um, but it's scary to me because, to my mind, it leads to a situation in which power is the only reality and weakness is the only sin. Now, I, I, I thought of the plague of wild beasts, except, and I probably shouldn't use it because it's an insult to the beast. Um, animals don't become inanimal, but humans can become inhuman. So, uh, this is certainly characteristic of Nazi thinking, that we're justified by power and will alone. Um, now, what is the Nazi view of human being then? What is the, the other human being? Um, 
Alfred Rosenberg, an infamous Nazi ideologue, very influential in Hitler, uh, executed as a war criminal in 1946, uh, explains that the, 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 the term race, soul, character, thought, all of these terms are, are synonyms. Uh, the term Rassenzela is, is, is frequently used in Nazi discourse, but it, the Nazis didn't invent it. Rassenzela, race, soul. German's great for putting words together, right? To make, to make new words. Race, soul. This is when, when, uh, when I'm teaching the Holocaust, one of the things I really have to do is explain to my American students the way Alfred Rosenberg's thinking of race is not how you and I think about race. The American culture. In, in the American culture, race is mostly about color. Right? Uh, it's not about, it's not mostly about uh, soul or essence. Um, from a Nazi point of view, then, a human being has value on two counts. One, you might call an accident of nature. You, you happen to be born as what they determine to be Aryan. Already you're, you're better. You have more value than the non-Aryan. And, and if you're an Aryan, you, you can take on even greater depth, substance, meaning, through resolve, through will, through determination. To transcend things like conscience, which Hitler says was a Jewish invention. Now, what is, what is the, the, Judaism represents a profound threat to that outlook. Rosenberg says that uh, the, the Aryan geist, the, the mind or spirit, spirit of the Aryan people, is threatened not just by Jewish blood, but by Judaism. Because the ism is in the blood. The ism is, the, is the, the disease, the contagion. Therefore, you have to, the, the extermination has to be total. Whether a Jew is, uh, you know, wearing payas and sitzes or not, you know, the, the side curls and fringes, uh, or not, or, or is an, uh, an atheist, he or she remains a carrier. Because the ism is in the character, the essence, the blood. Um, this is, you know, the Nazi propaganda poster. And you can see, I mean, the, the, the Krankheitserregner is the, the, the contagion. It's Judaism. Um, and the, the, the public health issue was a, was a common metaphor then and now. The Jew as a disease. Um, the, uh, the, the Nazi equivalent of the AMA journal published articles to that effect, comparing the Jews to uh, tuberculosis. Uh, it's in every society. It threatens every society. It's in, you can't see it. And notice also here that the, like the protocols, they're hidden. You can't see them. They're invisible, as invisible as Satan. The bacteria are invisible. You can't see it, but it'll kill you. <clears throat> it'll kill your guy. It'll kill your mind. It'll kill your, your spirit, your soul. Now, how uh, is the value of the other human being understood in Judaism? Mind you, it's the value of the other human being, not me. The question is about my relation from above is about my relationship to my fellow human being. Um, as you know, according to the story, the human being is created in the image and likeness of the Holy One. Therefore, the human being bears a trace of the infinite. Something that can't be observed. 
weighed, measured, or counted. The human being has an infinite value regardless of how old or young, smart or dumb, handsome or, or ugly or whatever. Nothing that meets the eye. No DNA is tied to the determination of the infinite dearness of the other human being. Um, because each soul emanates from the Creator, each soul is, is metaphysically connected through the, the source of the emanation. And physically connected through the first human being. What is the Hebrew word for human being? Adam. Son of Adam. Adam. Ben Adam, right? Child of Adam. I like it. Um, the rabbis ask, why does God begin with one and not two? You need two. And, uh, of course, the rabbis, when they ask the question, they have dozens of responses. But one that I sort of like is, it's so that no one can say to another, my side of the family is better than your side of the family. There's only one side of the family. And we are family. With all of the implications and obligations that come with that. You see. Uh, you see this in Levinas, and his, uh, when he addresses human to human relation as paternal relation, and and sometimes as uh, you know, the, the the aspect of the feminine is very important there too, Levinas. But it's the other human being is like a child placed in my care, regardless of the age differential. So this this is the contagion. Um, so you have this radical separation, where in Judaism you have a radical connection. National Socialism you have a radical separation. From, from, for a Nazi, a Jew has no more in common with an Aryan than, than, than you have in common with, a, with a, an insect. Right? I mean, the scene in Schindler's List, when I'm on Gert, is, is very attracted to Helen Hirsch, the, the young girl that he takes in as his servant. He's very attracted. There's a scene. She's terrified, horrified. He's, and he's, he's the creepiest guy you can imagine. He says to her, it's too bad you're not human. There might have been a future for us. He can't take her. You might think, why didn't he just take her? He's got, because he's, he is a Nazi. In his mind, he thinks she's an animal, like an animal. So look at that. I mean, you have these two images. The Aryan, it's an image of power, purity, resolve, godlike. Uh, the Jew, dark, disgusting, demented, diseased. Um, So, anybody ever been to Trump's so? <coughs> Then you know it's pretty far north. <laughs> Have you seen the memorial to the 17 Jews that were murdered from Trump's so? Uh, in 1943, the Nazis sent some of their people to go get the 17 Jews living in the Arctic. That's not scapegoating. That's not xenophobia. It's not even racism, really. They have to, to if, 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 if Judaism is the disease and the Jews are the carrier and you want to eliminate the disease, you have to eliminate every instance of it. It's like fighting AIDS. How many cases of AIDS are tolerable? None. Um, this is extraordinary. This is unprecedented. This isn't ethnic cleansing. 
going to, to the Arctic yet. Now, enter Hassan al Um What does all this have to do with Hamas? I mean, where, how do you get from here to Hamas? Uh, in March of 1928, uh, um, Hassan al and five other men founded the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Um, it, was, uh, it was in Egypt, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow, but it was, you know, it was in Egypt and uh, under a colonial thumb, which is from the British, which is like a context, ruled by a king, a rule that was put in place by the British. Uh, so that's part of the context. Also, what's happening in the 20s is post-World War I, uh, the, I mentioned the protocols uh, of the elders of Zion already, uh, they didn't really widely circulate until the end of World War I, when uh, all sorts of conspiracy theories were arising uh, in Europe, and certainly in Germany. How could, how could we have lost? Up until the very the end, the Germans thought they were winning. They, weren't, they didn't fight any battles on German soil. What do you mean we lost? The, well, the answer to the Jews, you know, the Dochstos, the stab in the back. So, uh, so the protocols were got, had wide circulation in Germany in 1926. They were translated into Arabic. Uh, so you, there's this throughout the 20s, this rapid spread of the protocols of the elders of Zion. Um, so it, that's also part of the context for the, uh, the founding of the Brotherhood. Um, whose slogan is uh, Allah is our goal, the Prophet is our leader, the Quran is our law, Jihad is our path, and uh, death in the, in the path of, of Jihad, serving Allah, is our highest desire, our highest wish. Now, Albana was a great admirer of Hitler. Um, mein Kampf had not been translated uh, altogether into Arabic, only small portions of it. I'm not sure it has, the whole thing has even yet been translated into Arabic. Big chunks have. Uh, you can get an, an Arabic, you'll see, I'll, I have a picture of an Arabic language edition of it. But uh, he was uh, an admirer of Hitler and the National Socialists uh, and expressed, you know, his debt in his own writings, his debt to Hitler for opening his eyes to various things and issues and strategies. Um, not the least of which, of course, is the, is the problem of the Jews, but uh, one thing that Albana says he, he learned from Hitler is what, what propaganda is and what it's about, what it can do. Um, by 1935, the Brotherhood had a, a propaganda division, and, uh, and, they, and they were hard at work. Um, of course, this famous line from Mein Kampf, uh, something of the most insidious lie will always stick. Um, what is propaganda about? What's its aim? It's, it's not to inform, certainly. <coughs> That's not the point, propaganda. It's not even to persuade, as Hitler explained. In other words, propaganda presents no argument, no if-then. It doesn't present a case. What does it do? It, it's, it's, its aim is to incite. Uh, incite what? Hitler says, uh, as he puts it, it is to incite wrathful hatred. So only this has. Wrathful hatred. Anger and hatred. And Albana says, this is what I got from him. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, you know, over the, the, the following subsequent years, as Bernard Lewis points out, some of the, uh, the propaganda campaigns in Egypt, uh, he says, Bernard Lewis says, the Jews are accused of infecting girls with syphilis and sending them to Egypt to spread the disease. Uh, they're accused of su supplying Egyptian women with hyper 
aphrodisiac chewing gum, as well as uh, deliberately spreading cancer among Egyptians and other Arabs by devising and disseminating carcinogenic cucumbers and shampoo. Uh, they're accused of promoting drug taking, devil worship, <coughs> and organizing a campaign to legalize homosexuality in order to undermine society. Um, in other words, all evil is Jewish. Now that's, I mean, that, these things, cucumbers and shampoo, it sounds absurd and ridiculous, but something will stick. Um, this is, the, uh, the Arabic language edition of Mein Kampf, uh, translated uh, by Louis al Hajj, a former Nazi who converted to Islam. Uh, this, is, this is the 1963 edition. There were earlier uh, translations of portions of it. On the right, as uh, an Arabic edition of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which in 19, the early 70s were the number one seller in the, in the Arabic-speaking world. Uh, this is a Syrian edition. But the, why do I show these? Um, the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was developing connections with the Nazis in the 1930s. They sent delegations to the Nuremberg rallies each year. They, in 1938, they uh, hosted the uh, parliamentary conference for Arab and Muslim countries in Cairo and handed out you know, copies of what they had of Mein Kampf and the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So you see that you know, the anti, which are both seriously anti-Semitic texts. So you see the, the, the uh, anti-Semitism is, is foundational to the thinking, to the ideology to the movement. The, the guy, the one who really made the shit up, the, the, the connection between the Brotherhood and the Nazis was Hajimin al-Husseini, um, who established his first connection in March of 1933 with a visit to Heinrich Wolf, uh, the, the new German consul in Jerusalem. Um, so, Hajimin al Husseini will prove to be a uh, you know, pivotal, pivotal figure in, the, in the, the line, the thread going from Hitler to Hamas. Um, he met with uh, Al Albana's brother in 1935. Um, the Brotherhood you know, worked with him. Where's, where does Hajimin al Husseini come from? Uh, al Husseini was a soldier in the Turkish army, First World War. He uh, was in uh, Smyrna, which is in the vicinity of the Armenian Genocide something that the Germans participated in, Germans as the allies of the Turks. Um, at least eight of them went on to become uh, administrators in the concentration camp system later. But they, um, that's this another seminar. Um, in 1920, uh, there was, there was you know, rioting in Palestine, and Hajimin al-Husseini was, uh, accused and actually convicted in absentia of inciting those riots. Um, when uh, Herbert Samuel became the, the, uh, the head of the British Mandate, he tried to uh, you know, reach out to uh, appease the Arabs, uh, at least a portion of the Arabs. And uh, he made Hajimina Husseini, Mufti of Jerusalem, in May of 1921. Um, one of the first actions of al Husseini was to um, declare a jihad against the British and the Jews. So, al Husseini, from the get go, 
was uh, seriously opposed to the Jewish presence in Palestine. In fact, I mean, he would he would make statements like which he would repeat later that uh, to kill a Jew is to please Allah. It's a religious duty. Uh, he who kills a Jew has a guaranteed place in paradise. So it, it goes from uh, eliminating an undesirable presence to pleasing God, not just pleasing the Fuhrer or the party or the folk. You see, it becomes a religious obligation to eliminate the Jews. So this, this goes into a different category. Now, there, uh, during the Arab Revolt, 1936-1939, you have the, the, the connection, the financial connection between Al Husseini and the Nazis tightening up. The Nazis helped to finance the revolt. Uh, the Brotherhood sent their, their people to participate in the revolt. Um, in 1937, um, Eichmann and his uh, sidekick, um, Hagen, set out to Palestine to meet with Al Husseini. Um, the, the historians, most historians say that uh, Eichmann never quite got there. He had, you know, the British wouldn't let him uh, you know, go in, go to Jerusalem. But uh, Herbert Hagen, apparently, the guy, his, his colleague, met with uh, Al Husseini. Two weeks later, Al Husseini had to flee Palestine, once again wanted by the British for inciting riots and the, and the Arab revolt. He, uh, Al Husseini, You know, by you know, very uh, circuitous, by circuitous route, made his way to Baghdad. Uh, from 1939 on, he was he was on the Nazi payroll. In April of 1941, he uh, was one of the key instigators of a coup, which was backed by the Nazis in, in Iraq to overthrow the, the British-backed government in Iraq. And uh, they, uh, in, uh, he launched the coup in uh, April, 1st of April, and for about six weeks, things were going well, but then the British managed to regain control. By the end of May, the British had suppressed the coup, but not before Haj Amin al Husseini incited another, you know, more rioting against the Jews at Baghdad, in what's known as the Farhud, in which uh, 600 Jews were murdered in Baghdad. Um, descendants of the survivors in Israel of the Farhud are still uh, in litigation with regard to reparations. As um, I testified at a trial in Israel uh, by Skype, by Skype testimony. I mean, it's in the middle of the night where I am during the day there. Regarding the question of, was the Farhud part of the Holocaust? Is there any connection to Nazis and the Farhud? And so I mean, I mean, I was you know, presenting evidence that yes, there is a connection through Hajimin al Husseini. So uh, he, he left town again. I uh, went from Baghdad to uh, Tehran, uh, from Tehran to Rome, from Rome to Berlin, where he had his first meeting with Hitler on the 28th of November 1941, and uh, right after meeting with Hitler, he, uh, he, did, he did sit down with Eichmann. Um, uh, Husseini wrote in his memoirs after this meeting, uh, he recalled after this meeting, um, you know, what had taken place between him and Hitler. He says, our fundamental condition for cooperating with Germany, our, that is, the, you know, the, the, the Arabs in the Middle East, to the extent that he had influence, 
uh, was a free hand to, er to eradicate every <coughs> last Jew from Palestine and the Arab world. I asked Hitler for an explicit undertaking to allow us to solve the Jewish problem in a manner befitting our national and racial aspirations and according to the scientific methods innovated by Germany in the, hand, in the handling of its Jews, the answer I got was the Jews are yours. So, uh, Hajimina Husseini was given very nice uh, accommodations in Berlin, very nice stipend. Uh, he, he was operating uh, six radio stations, doing broadcasts over six radio stations in Arabic language to you know, spread Nazi propaganda to that part of the world. Um, and again, we would repeat the refrain, you know, kill Jews wherever you find them. It, it's a holy act pleasing to God and, and that, this kind of discourse. He also became uh, very close to uh, not only Eichmann, but uh, he, he traveled to concentration camps where he, uh, he met uh, Rudolf Hirsch in Auschwitz. Uh, Franz Zierus in Mauthausen, uh, Theresienstadt, Siegfried Seidel, um, Belsen, Commandant Josef Kramer, and others. The, he, it seems, though, he was uh, perhaps closest to Himmler. Uh, Him, Himmler was given the honor of implementing the final solution, and the S, Himmler and the SS. Uh, here you happen to see him meeting with Himmler in 1943. Um, he also worked with Himmler to organize uh, Muslim killing units, the most famous of which was the, uh, the 13th Hanshar Division, operating in the Balkans. Um, organized in February and then went into action in February 1944. Um, this is something not often covered in uh, history books about the Holocaust. Not often covered in Holocaust museums. I'm sure you know, most of you have been to the Holocaust Museum. Uh, you probably didn't see this in it. Some, some have it, but most don't. Uh, most of the Muslims in the Hanshar division, which is all Muslim, were, were not Arabs. Most of them were from the Balkans. Uh, some claim that he that Haj Amin recruited as many as 100,000 to serve in these units. Um, and the, each regiment had its, uh, its religious leader, its religious guide. The largest Hanshar had more than 21,000 men. Large group. The, uh, the commander, Carl Gustav Zabritzweig, reported that the Muslims seek to cure the mission of a second prophet. The Nazis uh, toyed with the idea of whether they could sell Hitler to the, uh, the Shiite world as the 12th Imam. No, they, they, they had that discussion. Remember, something was stiff. Yeah. Uh, they decided that uh, they, they may not buy that. But it was widely circulated by Hajimin himself that uh, Hitler was a closet Muslim. In Louis al Hajj's introduction to the Arabic language uh, edition of Mein Kampf, he describes Hitler's comp, his, his struggle as a jihad, and Hitler as a jihadist. So you see, you see Hitler himself, and he's, Hitler's given uh, Arabic names. Um, so this connection, the connection through Hajimina Husseini, becomes tighter and tighter and tighter. Now, back to 
brotherhood from which Hamas arises. When the war came to an end, Hajimina Husseini was a wanted war criminal. There were more than 150,000 named Nazi war criminals. One of them was Hajimina Husseini. There wasn't much of an effort to track him down. The people in the Balkans, the former Yugoslavia and so on, they were really pressing, you got to get this guy. The Allies were kind of lukewarm on him. They weren't hot on his trail. He found a very comfortable hiding place in France till he returned uh, to, well, he didn't return, he went to Egypt, went to Cairo in June 1946, where he had a Hebrew, a Hebrew's welcome. Uh, Albana welcomed him as uh, you know, a great jihadist who was uh, carrying out jihad during the war, standing side by side uh, with Hitler. <coughs> And uh, it's, it's here, at this point, that Hajimin uh, becomes a, a full-fledged member of the Brotherhood. And then he always had close ties. I mean, in the 30s, he had close ties. Uh, it's, in the, it's in 1946 that he met uh, Saeed Kutu, who also speaks of the extermination of the Jews in, in religious terms. Saeed Kutu, uh, is a modern thinker in this respect. It's, it's always kind of struck me that the, uh, the jihadist movement is uh, a purist movement. Uh, Kutub was trying to purify Islam of Western influences. Jah Jahiliya. Jahiliya? Is that how you say? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the corrupting influence of the West, the decadence of the West, and yet, uh, he picks up one of the most characteristic features of uh, European anti-Semitism, namely this essentialist view, which is a departure from traditional Islamic view, namely that a Jew can become a Muslim, no problem. Not for a Kutu. The Jew is irredeemable because the Jew is, the, is, as he says, the blackest devil. A Jew can't become a Muslim any more than, than Satan can become a saint. So uh, he and, I mean, Hajimin and uh, Kutub share this. Um, also in 19, later in 1946, um, Al Husseini took uh, one of his relatives under his wing, uh, as I always get this wrong, uh, Yasser Arafat, whose mother was the daughter of Al Husseini's first cousin. So uh, Yasser Arafat received uh, indoctrination and training from the Muslim Brotherhood. In 2002, Arafat, in, in re re recalling his mentor, Hajimin Al Husseini, Al Husseini who died in 1974, said, I, I always followed his teaching, he was always my mentor, he was always my guide. So when, when Arafat went on to, uh, to found uh, Fatah in 1959, uh, he was seeking guidance and counsel from Hajimin Al Husseini. Um, Zal Khala, one of the PLO deputies. You know, the, the PLO was then established in uh, 1964. Uh, the charter drafted in 1968. Uh, in the charter, you, you see this. You see the, the influence of Hajimin al Hussein. You can see, uh, for example, uh, Articles 9, 10, and 21 that, uh, that they, the charter allows no room for the peaceful negotiation with the Israelis or the Jews. Um, Article 20 says the claims of historical or religious ties of Jews with Palestine are incompatible with the facts of history. The Jews were never here. There's no connection historically. So, I mean, you see this, uh, this removal of the Jews not only from space, but from time, from history itself. Um, 
Article 22 says that Israel is a threat to peace, not in only in the Middle East, but to the whole world. So you get this language of uh, humanity as itself being at stake. It's, and it's reminiscent of you know, phrasing you see in Mein Kampf. Uh, if, if we lose the war against the Jews, Hitler says, it will mean the, the funeral wreath for all of humanity. All of humanity. It's apocalyptic. It's Gog and Mangog. It's uh, salvation, damnation. It's, it, it has this metaphysical dimension. It isn't reducible to political conflict, uh, social conflict, cultural conflict, territorial conflict. I mean, the usual, what, what, to use a fancy word, the ontological categories. Um, now, you say, well, the Charter says no peaceful negotiations. What happened? In the 1970s, um, there was a, a shift in the PLO to what is termed the phased strategy. You take a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And uh, in 1977, Salah Khalaf, Ibu Iyad, Abu Iyad, Salah Khalaf said, said that the, once we have an independent state in the West Bank and Gaza, he says, then we will, then it will be the beginning of the final solution. Uh, again, in 1993, another PLO deputy, Sakhar Kabash, says, uh, once again we control Gaza and the West Bank, we will proceed to the final solution. So they use this, I mean, they're using this language, knowing very well what it means. <coughs> to address dealing with the Jewish problem, the Jewish question. Now, we're, getting, we're coming to Hamas. Uh, Ahmed Yassin. Ahmed Yassin founded Hamas on December 9, 1987. He, he had been operating on behalf of the Muslim Brotherhood since 1973. Uh, where, when he went to Gaza. Uh, and he's known for statements like, uh, you know, killing Jews, Israelis, and Zionists. And, he, and they, that's, they, they're, all, they're all three are the same, Jews, Israelis, Zionists, is an act of devotion. It's not a political necessity. Uh, an economic necessity, a strategic necessity. It's an act of devotion. Devotion to what? To whom? How is it that, that killing someone, not a combatant, not an, you know somebody who's shooting at you, an act of devotion? Yes, it's a, it's a question that, that's crucial, I think, to understanding at this point. Um, so, he, he, you know, Ahmed Yassin, founder of Hamas, had his upbringing in, in the Brotherhood, his training, and he was an emissary of the Brotherhood um, in Gaza. Killing is now. Now, yeah, that's the, what I mentioned before, the viewing the, the killing of Israelis and Jews as, as an act of devotion is a modern move. I mean, people often look at jihadists and say they're a throwback to the medieval times. This is not, if only they were. They're not a throwback. This is something new. And it's and, and, and it's 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 an incorporation of a of the longest hatred in a modern manifestation. I mean, Democritus, Greek philosopher, fifth century B.C., 
claimed that, that the Jews would sneak up on strangers on the roads and, and, and kill them and take their blood to use in their temple offering. The blood libel. It doesn't begin in Norwich in 1144. It begins in the 5th century BCE. Uh, Tacitus complained that the Jews are backward because they, they refuse to engage in child sacrifice. So I mean, Jew hatred is pre-Christian, has its Christian manifestation, has its, uh, its Islamic manifestation. But this is something, this is something different. This, this modern national socialist jihadist thing, which I, I hope I'm showing our connection, uh, is a new, is, is a new development. Um, the Charter of Allah. This, I wonder if I shouldn't save this for post-break. Why, well, I'll, I'll pause. This would be a good place to pause for a few minutes of questions. Uh, we'll come back after the break and do this a little more and then we'll do more questions and discussions. I'm going to stop. This is a good place to stop. I, I was just struck if I understood correctly about this last comment about going back to, I guess it's Roman or Greek sources um, of anti-Semitism. And those two that you mentioned seem to be, in some sense, in, in opposition to each other. Democrates accusing the Jews of yeah, yeah. killing children, and Tacitus accusing them of not killing children. Right. <laughs> What's your point? <laughs> I mean, that Jews are, are capitalists and communists. Jews are killed. Jews are whatever evil you want to attach. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks for the instructor lecture. I have just one uh, small comment uh, concerning uh, Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche was an opponent of anti-Semitism as a person, and in his last year of life, uh, even he was insane. He said, uh, "We have to." We have to shoot all the anti-Semites. So, I mean, well, and he ridiculed anti-Semitism. And he he ridiculed yeah. it because it was vulgar, uh, because it it was uh, kind of going with the crowd, uh, and and rather than originating from this inner will and resolve. Yes, he did. He ridiculed it as something vulgar. But the point there is not that he was an anti-Semite, but it's the idea of the thinking is that the, the authenticity, the substance, the meaning of the individual is in, and lies in an inner will, an inner resolve. But that, thank you for pointing that out. That's correct. Can I make a short follow-up? I think uh, maybe the, the, it appears as an, uh, um, it implies that uh, Martin Luther and Richard, and Richard Wagner uh, were very much of anti-Semites. I the same role like Immanuel Kant and Philip Nietzsche. And I think there is a part of their uh, ideas who can be used for uh, existentialism, uh, which can be used as a part of national socialism. But it's another case because you can use Martin Luther directly for anti-Semitic slurs and violence. But when it comes to Kant or Nietzsche, it's more difficult to bring it up. I, I, I would agree. But the question I was addressing is, so what is the view of human being here? Okay. Yeah. No, I would like to agree with Matteo about we can, we can add also Hegel or Herder to, to the, the view of uh, his phenomenology of spirit, a pure race. Uh, Hegel was in it. He wrote about... about Absolutely. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, uh, Voltaire. Yeah. Oh, we could yeah. add... Yeah. 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 You can go, like uh, Olika said, fix that. So there are um, plenty of them. So I was listening to you and this sort of horrific description of uh, all this hatred. And the thing that struck me was that we're living in a moment in, where, in which those of us in the West that get a progressive education, who care about human rights, who have good intentions and try to make the world a better place, that we're schooled to think that these characters um, are once colonized and debased by the Europeans and that they are sort of somehow <coughs> force uh, trying to read 
the region and partner and whole of the colonial enterprise of Jews. And um, this is, to me, so I was sort of hearing all sort of the basis of this uh, reality, and I'm thinking of what's going on in university campuses in North America and in Europe, and the, the uh, disconnect. So you don't get these lectures in any uh, university departments and good universities in the West. Well, there's at least one where they. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how do you uh, how do you so how do you deal with this sort of contemporary situation, this contemporary intellectual and political moment? Well, yeah, um, David Hirsch is going to talk about left wing uh, anti-Semitism, which is largely in that in the academy in academia. Um, that's a good question. Uh, addressing jihadism and as a source of anti-Semitism and addressing uh, what's, what happens on many campuses it might seem like two different tasks, but they are related. Um, we both see the Jew as a corrupting influence, as uh, you know, con contaminating uh, it's, it's guilty of whatever evil there might be, whether it's sacrificing or not sacrificing, uh, whether you know racism, human rights violation, apartheid, uh, colonialism. I mean, colonial, colonialism means bad. There's no good colonialism. So, uh, I mean, just what is the agenda? Um, the, I mean, are the Jews the only colonial power? Are the Jews even a colonial power? That's, I mean, that's subject to examination, it seems to me. When you, say, when you say colonial power, you're thinking what European countries largely, like British, Belgian, French, German, Netherlands. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure what more to say about that. Um, but they do, if, if the aim, again, is not to persuade, but to incite. And if the enemy is the Jew, then it makes for all sorts of strange bedfellows. I really appreciate what you've done by restoring the metaphysical, emphasizing the theological metaphysical connections, and brilliantly describe connections between Hitler and Hamas, etc. The point I can't accept um, is the reduction. Yes, you cannot reduce Nazism or Nazi anti-Semitism to Versailles or economics. I cannot separate the essential element of race both from the 19th century racial connections with Nazi ideology and the overwhelming image of the Jew as a racial type, which admittedly there are many, there are black Jews, there are Asian Jews. The Nazis sort of knew that, but not really. They had, they had an image, and I don't see how you separate racism as just an important but not essential element to anti-Semitism for the Nazis. It's, uh it, 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 manif it certainly manifests as racism. Racism is obviously there. Uh, the, the what I have, what I, what I do suggest in, in bringing up the term Ras and Zela, the, the way in which the Nazis are thinking about race is 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 not reducible to an anthropological phenomenon. It it has this. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a category of thought and not something observed in the world. Now they can, I mean, I mean the images of the Jews that I put up, they're obviously, it's something you can see, but does, has anyone ever seen a Jew that looks like these images? The, <laughs> monstrous and it's, so it's uh, of course that's part of the problem. The Jew looks just like you and me. Uh, the, the Jew, the German Jews, are not so radically different from the non-Jewish the non Germans, are they? I mean, they they're not like the Ostjuden, who look quite different. Uh, the Jew, the 
I mean, did the Nazis uh, had camps in, uh, there was a camp in Tunisia, North African Jews were in a camp in Tunisia. They're not Ashkenazi. They don't, I mean, they don't yeah, do that. But the, what is, what they do is to exploit the stereotype. The stereotype is already there. The Nazis didn't invent the racial stereotype. As you said, it goes back before the 19th century and, and even before. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, my claim is it's not, it's, it's a manifestation, race, race and racism of anti-Semitism, but anti-Semitism is not a subset of racism. It's, that's my question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, David. Um, fantastic. Um, and, and very, very provocative in the most positive sense of the word for me. Um, and I, I, I got stuck on the Ross and Sailor uh, kind of concept too. That's very much in, in, in my area of focus. And so I wanted to hear, I suppose, um, that perhaps we can later drill a, a little bit more drilling down on that um, uh, race concept at some point. Because even to accept I mean, the, the anthropological uh, notion of is, of course, to embrace truly unstable concepts, right? In terms of uh, biological racial fixity and all that. And even the focus on color. Because it can't be confined simply to that. Because it can't race on the brown certain parts of the it's more about your money than your skin color. Yeah, okay. Right? Class. And, right? Right. No, as class. Like, no, you're white because we have more money. Right. Right, right, like, right. Yeah, like in Argentina. Right. right. Right? Where you have to speak French to show that you're really there. Right? Yeah. It, right? And, 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 um, and so it's, it's a truly unstable concept in and of itself. So I would like to see that shaken a little bit more in, in the the analysis, and I also just want to tie to it. I was really interested when you when you talked about the idea of soul too, um, um, because I'm thinking like say Winthrop Jordan, white over black, and there's there's wonderful treatment of how enslaved Africans. You saw the Phyllis Wheatley poem that I asked Femi to come on some some of you the other day. The, the, that there was a, a huge debate. Uh, in the states and through and other and other places in, in the uh, diaspora around the uh, African the, the, the enslavement of Africans, um, the, the slave trade, um, as to whether they could be Christianized, right? Could they, they did, did could you you know you have this nice bit of property in this brown body? Could you um, convert that to Christianity? Well, no. Could you maybe? That's a theological question. Because do they have a soul? Well, if they have a soul, aren't they your What's the Adam's brother, you know, Adam's brother. Well, that's the debates, too, in right. Spain, over the New World. <coughs> yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? So, I, well, I, I thank you for, for interesting topic. It's yeah. given me a lot to work with. That's the first piece, and I want to work through it some more. Well, don't forget the uh, Judaism. Uh, the, the, the threat of the Jew is not just the, the, the wrong race. It's the, the teaching and testimony that they represent by the presence in the world. It's the, the, the Torah is the problem. So therefore, in the Nuremberg Laws in 1935, that, that codified who was a Jew, a Jew was anyone with a Jewish grandparent, the grandparent is Jewish if he or she was a member of a synagogue. Uh, also regarded as a Jew under the law as anybody who was converted to Judaism. But, but, but the Nazis did not consider Karaites to be racially Jewish. That's correct, because they rejected Judaism. Yeah. In fact, so, Karaites in Lithuania were Accomplices to that. So, David, thank you. So, we're going to have a tea break, and at 11 o'clock, we're going to continue. Great job.